Okay, folks. Okay, good afternoon. Yeah, welcome to join our Sunday service. Okay, today is a special one. Okay, later we are, I'm going to announce it. Okay, the best special uh, Sunday worship. Okay, so first thing first. Okay, let me uh, welcome. Okay, our the newcomer. If you have if you have any. Okay, let me see the left hand side. Okay. Anyway, yeah, he is uh, Eric's mom. Join us. Okay. Give any time. Okay. We just give a big hand to our uncle and auntie. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me have my uh, right hand side. Okay. No. Okay. Just I uh, remind you guys. Okay. In order to show respect, uh, especially to our Lord Almighty and also the preacher. Okay. Please. Okay, don't just put all your electronic devices into your pocket, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your co cooperation. Okay, and also now is uh, let us uh, read uh, our Bible verses, monthly scripture. We are going to read three times. Okay, the first and the second time we are going to read in English, but the last time we are going to read in Chinese Pinyin. Okay, now let us read God's word. If then you have been raised with Christ, Seat the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Book of Colossians, chapter 3, 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seat the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 1. And also the last one is written Pinyin. So you I'm going to invite a Tinian, okay, to make some announcement. Alrighty. Hi, everybody. Um, here are your announcements for this week. The first one is that our church will hold its 14th annual outdoor prayer meeting on December 16th, that's a Saturday, starting from 8 o'clock to 9.30 at our church's main entrance, uh, commemorating all the persecuted Chinese house churches. All are welcome to join, and this will serve as a fellowship event, so there will be no regular one in our uh, lower auditorium in the evening. Um, this year, they've uh, made a couple adjustments to, uh, to accommodate any of our uh, English congregation members. So um, I think there's a English version of the bulletin, so it's not gonna be all in Chinese now. Um, and there's also a translator for Pastor Hong's um, short message or sharing. Uh, I believe there is also a brief announcement for Mr. Fong. So I, I have to come up here to emphasize the importance of this event, okay, to pray for those uh, persecu under fierce persecution, okay, in China. Uh, because to some uh, our youth, they say, oh, he's so far, far away. It's none of our business. Okay, folks, I just remind you guys, if we must not stand up for these righteousness things, one day when we are under persecution, nobody, okay, no brother, imagine no brothers and sisters support us. What do you feel, okay? And we, on the one hand, we say, oh, wow, all church are brothers and sisters in Christ. But on the other hand, when they are under fierce persecution, we just say, I don't care. And to me, he is a hypocrite. Okay? He is double standard. Okay, so folks, our church treat it very seriously. Okay, so even we treat it not to, uh, starting this year, we treat it as, as, a, as a, a fellowship. Okay, so please come as 8 o'clock and taste just a little bit, or maybe raining or snowing, or sunshine, no, it doesn't matter. But just taste a little bit uncomfortable, just a little bit, one and a half hour. And But do, can you imagine, they lost their job, their husband, okay, even Mrs. Pong uh, went back to China to visit those wives, their, their husband, those church pastors, all put in jail, and they have the small kids. So what do you feel and what do you think? And they just government just make an excuse and throw them in jail. Okay, and after a while, we have just a one minute of very short script for you to see to prepare our heart. Because very often we just say the same thing, come to the church freely, it's just a take it for granted, just like an air. No, in this world, Lord your praise, Lord doesn't like this. 
and you will see is a, suddenly a police in the church and all the, the pastors stop preaching. Okay, so maybe the, they are just because they are in this new situation, you don't hear anything. It's just blah, 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 blah. But I just introduce you the background. Okay, uh, one day, don't think Canada is uh, very safe. No, no, no. We in the fellowship, we read the, uh, the is a, uh, 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 what? A spectrum haunting on uh, North America. One day, you never know. Okay, the police rush rush in and order us to stop preaching. Okay, so it's just a one minute. Okay, taste the confusion. Okay, the injustice. Okay, the preachers is stop. Okay, at the spot. Okay, so and this church is uh, in the past 22 years. They exit in the China and they preach every Sunday. But once the policy change, the government can stop them at their will, at his own will. Okay, so please taste and just and let the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit prepare our heart so that we can join this uh, 14th annual okay prayer outdoor prayer meeting. Okay, uh, David, would you mind? Is uh, is prepared ready? The one minute script. Okay. Okay, 由于中国特色那我们就到这里为止好不好我们就是我们仍然在线上给敬拜我们在祝福里面好我们收拾一下我们就在祝福里面敬拜好我们暂时再见好吧再见So yes, um, it'll be on December 16th. It's a, a, de a decent early start, 8 a.m. But um, there will be breakfast afterwards. This is this breakfast is only open to the English congregation. Um, and there will be an email sent out with details regarding this. Um, so hopefully see you guys there. The next announcement is our church will host an online sharing session on November 28th at 7.30 uh, for recent high school graduates and their parents. The purpose is to encourage graduates to pursue higher education within the province, and Pastor Ron will be sharing uh, a spiritual guidance behind this decision. And then uh, next, our English Congregation Choir will sing hymns in the, um, one hymn, um, in the main hall on December 3rd. May our Lord use them to glorify his name. Uh, and next, baptism class will start on December 17th. If you wish to be baptized on Easter uh, in 2024, please contact Mr. Pong. And then um, also uh, coming up, we're swinging into the Christmas season. So Gabriel Fellowship will meet on December 23rd to celebrate Christmas. There will be games, snacks, and a gift exchange. Um, it's the white elephant gift exchange game that we play every year. Please invite your friends to join us and everyone is welcome. We've sent an email with details. Um, so please sign up before December 18th so we can plan accordingly. If you have any questions, please contact JJ or Leslie. JJ, do you have any announcements or? <laughs> friends and a gift um, excellent so look out for that email if you haven't if you don't receive that email or you think you're not included in the email list um, just reach out to any of the stewards and um, they'll add you onto that contact list there all right now that brings us to our Bible verse memorization challenge um, this week's is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 do we have any takers Mr. Pong <laughs> Thank you. 
Good job, good job. Any one else? Any other challengers? Jonathan. Great job, great job. Any other challengers? Go once, go twice. All righty. Um, so this is the verse for next week. If you guys could all read it with me, it comes from First Timothy chapter one, verse seventeen. To the King of the Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. And then shorter catechism number one hundred seven. What does the conclusion? of the Lord's Prayer teach us. The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, teaches us to be encouraged by God in our prayers and to praise him by acknowledging that kingdom, power, and glory are his, to show that we want to be heard and have confidence that we are. We say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so that begins our worship service. I now invite Mr. Fong for a call to worship. Okay, folks, call to worship. Now, please stand up and recite God's word. We are going to invite all to, uh, brothers and sisters to read it from verse 1 to verse 19. Uh, Psalm 73. Okay, yes. Now, let's read the, the God's word, okay? Truly, God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my step had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I was the prosperity of the weak. For they have no pains until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their nakedness. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with folies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struck through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the weak, always at ease. They increase in richness. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I will betray the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a worrisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utter by terrors. Okay. Please, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is so pure, so variable, just like pure gold. Yes, this question, exactly, we always ask, why those unrighteous men is so prosperous? When we see, yeah, when we are grow up, we see this word is just so messy. It's uh, not uh, just a lot of fairy story in this world. No, we see so many people, 
they those are a great people. They just in the high position. They use their power to oppress those poor. And where is the righteousness? We are always us. There are so many unfair things in this world, Lord. That sometimes we even doubt our belief too. But this Bible words just give us a very, very good reminding. You are our God, our Lord. You are the creator of this universe. That in the every inch of this universe is full of your wisdom, power, and glory. Lord, let us totally trust. Put our trust in your own, in your hand, and just follow your wholehearted and diligent, Lord. When those depression, when those unhappiness, and those uh, yeah, un- unjust things stricken us and challenge us and hurt us, we use this Bible verse to just protect us. Thanks, God. Your word is so good. And just let us our eyes look on on the eternal life. It is just very in this world. We just our life just of seven years or eighty, even ninety years, and it will just gone. All things will gone one day, but your words, your kingdom is eternal. Lord, please remind us this again and again daily, so that we just follow you. Just treat and call you my Lord, my Master, and my Savior. We pray in your precious name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our first song, "His Mercy Is More." This is a newer song, um, so if you know it, please sing loudly. mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new evermore, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs be left omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy. Sins they are many, his mercy is 
our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Thank you. You may be seated. Now is the time for prayer of confession. Um, our Bible verse comes from Psalms chapter 19, verse 12 to 13. It says, who can, concern, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Please take this moment to bow your heads and confess your um, sins. Gracious and merciful God, we come to you to confess our sins. Many times we stumble and fall into temptation, and you alone know the true weakness in our hearts. Almighty God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. God, we confess our sins, and we confess the truth of your word. You said that if we confess our sins, you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come before you with a humble heart, asking for forgiveness. Thank you for Jesus and his atonement for our sins. Please help me walk, help us walk in your way in this upcoming week and not be led astray by the temptations of this world. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, let us recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now please stand as we sing our second song, Amazing Grace. My chains are gone.
white snow the sun far Christians, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Um, Today's sermon um, will be by Pastor Bayes, and it's a question and response Sunday. Um, and the uh, message uh, biblical verses come from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Um, it also comes from Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 to 34. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, Son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. I now invite Pastor Bays to the pulpit. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again for coming in. Questions, especially if you were doing it for a while, I think they're a little relevant. Um, 
Okay. Uh, and so I'm just going to begin with the first question here, um, which is a really great question. Uh, it's the only one I've read in advance. <laughs> well, what are some concrete ways in which to approach a conversation about faith with an unbelieving friend that often feels very awkward and forced? That's, a, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, a couple things come to mind, uh, and I'm sure you'll have better reflection even after my answers later as well. Um, a couple things come to mind. One is how we share Jesus, I think first and foremost has to be in how we're living, right? Um, if we are living a life where we're trying to lean into that Sermon on the Mount way of being, um, and we're honest about our failures with our friends as well, but we also name our faith in various ways, it's not forced, but as it becomes natural part of us, then those opportunities to share faith become a little less awkward. Um, I think the other thing is I got saved in a very conservative church and we did cold turkey evangelization like we went to the mall in teams and talked to people that we did not know with zero relationship. It was horrifying, right? Um, and, uh, and anyway, I'm not sure that was the best way to teach evangelization, but right these days we've pendulum swung in a lot of ways to the other side because there's of some of the, the garbage that needed to be sort of exposed in churches across the world. But Jesus is still at work, and the Holy Spirit is still drawing people into the kingdom. And so finding those ways to, to pray for your friends, um, you know, pray for uh, those sort of divine conversations or divine appointments to share. But I would say really being sensitive to where they're at in the Holy Spirit, not just trying to bulldoze someone to faith. Um, that just doesn't work uh, for most people. Now, every once in a while, someone may have been wrestling ahead of time who you will encounter and they're ready to have that conversation. You can kind of take your cues from them. And so sometimes our, our people, when people uh, open up that way, we, we're freaked out because we're like, no way, they want to talk about spiritual things. And then we shut down the conversation. Well, you're the person that knows more probably than they do on that journey. And uh, so go well, down the road as far as you can with the person. But finding different ways, praying for them, looking for those openings. Sometimes when we're experiencing loss and pain, it's a good time to uh, talk about how your faith, how Jesus has made a difference in your life, or, or how you even wrestle with your faith. It doesn't always have to be like all roses and sunshine. It can also be some of your, I'm wrestling, and yet I'm still finding uh, the, the, the attraction of Jesus in my life as well. Um, so really, it's, it's the con context matters. The relationship matters. Um, and don't shy away if that person's opening up. Like, like that's sort of the weirdest thing. Sometimes we're like, oh my goodness, they're opening up about this, and we're scared. <laughs> to, but trust the Holy Spirit in those moments. Lean in instead of leaning out. And sometimes, oh yeah, the other thing I want to say about this too is the next step is usually a great way to think about this. How can I help this person take a next step in their curiosity about spiritual things, about Jesus, about whatever it is they're wrestling with? Um, you're not necessarily going to help that person cross that line of faith or give their allegiance to Jesus in that moment. Um, but what is that next step 
as they're opening up, as you're seeing the Holy Spirit at work. So really pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Where's God already working? Um, if a friend's completely closed, it's probably unhelpful to try to drag them into church on Sunday. Um, and well, most likely you won't be able to do that. Or if you are, it's coercion and coercion is usually not authentic conversion. So let's not do that. Um, but look for those opportunities because they are there. People are, well, I trust the Holy Spirit is at work. Oftentimes there's stuff we got to get out of the way. Barriers, uh, you know, maybe apologetics work, maybe, um, you know, talking about the, the bigger scope of the church than just what's happened in Canada historically, et cetera. Like be thinking, um, yeah, the more you know, and the more you lean into your faith, the more the Holy Spirit has to work with in terms of that other person as well. So it's a great question. I could speak on that for like hours. So all of, I imagine all of these would be like that. Um, should I move on to the next one? Okay. Um, by the way, I blacked out names. There were names. I just say, uh, yeah. So anyway, I'm not going to name names. So, <laughs> um, Ooh, this is a good one. Okay. Let me, oh, sorry. I should read that out loud while I'm reading it. Uh, so, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so next time we'll have the tech team do that so they can be a moderator and it'll be less clunky that way. How do we know the Bible as we know it translated into English inerrant word of God? Um, it, how do we know that the Bible, as we know it, is the inerrant Word of God? Doesn't it seem to be a circular argument? We know that it is the Word of God because it says it is the Word of God. Ooh, ooh, all right. I think there's actually like five or six questions in that one question. Um, so let me. So how do we talk about the, the authority of Scripture? Okay. So Christians debate on the nature of this, but I'm going to just go with where most evangelicals all who use the language authoritative, inerrant, inspired, or some combination of those terms that we believe the Bible, that God speaks through it in a way that is uh, life-changing and it's not just reading it like any other historical piece of literature, right? Now, two things I would say about this. In the New Testament, and um, this may determine if I'm back in the new year, we'll see how this question goes. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Pong, these are dangerous questions depending on the church. So I would say two things. One is that the church started before the Bible was finalized. So if you know Christian history, you know that the first couple centuries and decades of the church, the New Testament was being written. I mean, we have stuff written in the 40s. I think some of the earliest datings, we would say like the 40s AD. So if Jesus ascends into heaven, like in the 30s uh, AD, think about the timeline there. Um, and those are some letters, uh, I think Thessalonians, Galatians, those are some of the earlier ones. Like, I'd have to look it up exactly. You can fact check me on that later. Um, and to the Gospels, it's believed they're written later, although there's a lot of debates. Like some conservative scholars would push for earlier dating. Some more liberal ones would push for later dating. Um, and then we have manuscript fragments of all those. We don't actually have the first century documents, but we have manuscript fragments more than any other ancient document of any kind ever globally. Like So in terms of fragments from those early years, so it's pretty pretty reliable in terms of the historicity of the book or the books, the scrolls that make up the books. But what it's saying here is the church was not launched on the Bible. Now I'm coming from a cons more conservative background myself. Uh, that can be really jarring to hear that for the first time. But let me just say this. The church is founded because these early followers of Jesus thought he was dead. And then it turns up that he shows up to them and 500 others and more. And the church would have been done at the crucifixion of Jesus if it weren't for the resurrection. And so the church is launched because these people have an encounter with the living Jesus that they were not expecting. They weren't expecting within their Jewish context. They weren't expecting at all. So keep in mind that the church predates the, the completed Bible as we know it. Obviously, Hebrew Bible existed before then, the Old Testament, but New Testament did not. And so when we talk about the authority of Scripture, as Scripture in the early church and they're uh, looking at books and people are writing in reflection, Paul's writing these letters, occasional letters, meaning uh, dealing with occasions or events going on in churches that needed addressing. The gospel authors realize oh, we need to write this down to give a, an ancient, auto, uh, ancient bi biographical sketch of Jesus, who this Jesus was. Um, as the church is going on and Jesus returned is not happening in the first century. So they're, so they're responding to that as well. But remember, first and foremost, the church was launched by the resurrected Christ and the sending of the Holy Spirit. And later on, they're writing this stuff down for us as time goes on and as the church becomes global from day one, pretty much. Um, so that's important to note. And this idea of the Jesus ascending into heaven and the Holy Spirit making Jesus real, this kind of testimony of experiencing uh, the risen Jesus has happened again and again and again. Now, some of us come to faith now because we have the Bible through reading about it, and we're encountering the Holy Spirit again, re-inspiring again that text 
about the story, the life of Jesus, and applying it into our context. And we have the testimony of the church, and churches have been more or less faithful over 2,000 years. Um, so there's that idea of continuity there, but that goes back to this relational encounter that the authority ultimately rests on the relationships. So when I talk about the authority of Scripture, I'm reminded of how a Scripture formed, because that's an important argument his historically. Now, that's giving a lot of weight to certain aspects of history in that. Uh, that may not be as compelling to some, very compelling to others. But that would be my response here. You get out of the circular argument by looking at the church and history as well. Um, yes, if you're just simply self-referencing the book. Um, the Holy Spirit does inspire, though. So, you know, over centuries, like people again and again have encounters with Jesus through reading the Bible, right? So, on the other hand, the Bible itself tells us, John, John's record in John chapter 5, the Pharisees had the old you know, would have been the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and Jesus said it was pointing me to, to him. And he said, you guys know the Bible, a verse and chapter, but you don't know. Well, there wouldn't have been verse and chapters back then, but you know the Bible in and out. Um, and yet you're missing the point that it's pointing to me. So you can still have the book and miss Jesus, apparently. Um, even the book says that. So um, yeah, break out of it through other arguments about the historicity of Jesus, the launch of the church. Uh, apologetics give us some other things to wrestle with. But ultimately, there's a step of faith required in anything spiritual, uh, you know, yeah. I guess that's a great question. I don't know who that was, but it's a great question. Um, um, there's another Bible question there. I'm actually going to skip that one and maybe move on to something uh, the next year. Who determines who gets into the Bible? Uh, who determined that? Um, actually, there's a great history, a lot of good, good Christian history books on that. Um, most of the books that were not put in the New Testament canon because of their connection with Jesus, uh, if they don't, if there was not a clear sense, early Gnosticism like tried to glom on to early Christianity, and so almost all those books that were rejected were a form of Gnosticism, which was another religious system, and how it spoke about Jesus. So the early church uh, people, as they were discerning these lists, basically does it does it fit in what we know of the resurrected Christ and we've experienced or not? And in some cases, there was enough continuity first generation or second generation relationship to Jesus, they could say, Jesus never said anything like that, you know, so like discerning. Um, but yeah, you, there's lots of great research on that and work on that as well. Okay, I'm jumping to the next blacked out name here. There are some pretty big differences between Catholics and Protestants, but also some key similarities and beliefs. Mr. Pong, I'm going to get fired from my uh, part-time guest job here. Um, there are some pretty big differences between Catholics and Protestants, but also some key similarities and beliefs. Does it affect salvation? Woohoo! Uh, where's Pastor Hong? I'm going to give that. There'll be some. Um, um, again, um, <clears throat> I'm going to answer this question like the elves, both yes and no. Uh, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, sorry, that was a Lord of the Rings quote there. Don't ask the elves an answer. They will tell you both yes and no. Um, something like that. Pretty big differences. Okay, so generally speaking, Protestants, we would affirm that uh, salvation is by faith alone, like the sola fide. If you're using the Westminster Catechism, Westminster Catechism, Heidelberg Catechism, okay, you're going to go through the solas, I believe, in that. Um, so by faith alone, grace alone, um, the, the scriptures alone. So when we think about salvation, we don't see it as a works-based thing, like you, you sort of earn your way in. A lot of religious systems, there are works that are tied into that. We believe that grace is the centerpiece of it, that we cannot earn our salvation. It is a gift of God, uh, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, right? Um, so in that, uh, some traditional Catholic, some t Catholic teaching says it's sort of a synergistic or there's a, there's a meritorious thing, but I'm not a Roman Catholic theologian, so I'm guessing that even, I know the Roman Catholics, the Lutherans, and some Reformed Church in Europe came to a new understanding of justification together because the Reformation in one way is correcting abuses. So usually when you correct abuses, you overreach. And so to bring it back into like, you, you may have colored your opponents uh, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in, a, in a way that uh, a darkness that they were not really there, put them in a dark light uh, where in fact the truth was probably somewhere in the middle. For example, we said the Apostles' Creed. Well, for the first almost thousand years of the church, there were some schisms, but mostly the church was unified, but developed differently in different regions of the globe. So I would say as someone who is following Jesus within any Christian tradition, um, who is leaning into his grace, has uh, named their allegiance of their life and is pointing the direction of their life towards understanding Christ through the worship, through word, through witness, uh, and being in community, that the Holy Spirit is at work. And there's places that are clearer and there's places that are less clear on that. 
Um, so I'm going to be carefully say that you could be in a Protestant church and have the head knowledge, um, but have not leaned into a growing relationship with God through the Spirit and, and, and the living community and Scripture, and you're, you might not be a, a Christian. Same thing, conversely, in the Roman church tradition, you may go through all the rituals and all the routines, and you may believe in, uh, you know, that the communion is uh, the body and the blood of Christ and all of that in, in a literal but mystical way and all of that, and have a living relationship with Jesus. Here's the good news. None of us gets to make that final judgment on anybody else. Um, and that's where we get into dangerous territory when we try to pronounce to someone, you're going to hell. Um, there may be lots of evidence and fruit in their life that, boy, they need the justice that hell will provide, um, but, but it's not helpful usually. And by the way, at the end of the day, none of us is on the throne. And so I'm kind of careful that I don't want to like kick God off the throne and say, you know what? I'm here to make the decision. No, 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 no. Um, uh, ultimately, we all stand before the maker and uh, I want to be able to say I've cast myself on the grace of Jesus and I've lived in that way and I've let that grace sort of work in my life over the long trajectory of my life and that I'm looking more and more like Jesus in a, in a shell kind of way just as you will look more and more like Jesus in each of your individual ways and, and the communities that he calls us to be in together. Um, okay, so that was a real long answer to that. See if we have another person up here, then they can kick me or the tech team can say, you know, we've got 15 more questions. Move on, move on. All right, you got to give me the signals. I don't know what they are, but, you know, <laughs> move on, brother, move on. Um, there's one more in this same frame here about other denominations. Um, Anglican, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodists, we might add Pentecostals, Mennonites, uh, other Baptists. When do, should the differences matter? These are really good questions. What's my time frame? Am I still okay? Uh, okay. So I would say what I found helpful over the years, and I've taught on this before, there's actually some great writings on this as well, is understanding the difference between what's primary, what's secondary, and what's like opinion, right? Uh, using churchy language, you could talk about dogma, doctrine, opinion. Uh, I like to use the center set way of thinking about it, Jesus at the center, and then other things in these outer layers. This is what's important. So like when we say the Apostles' Creed, I love it. I, I, in every church I've been, we brought in using the Nicene Creed. It's a little longer, longer. It goes in a little more detail about a few things. Um, but really defining the center of Jesus. If these churches stand within little o, lowercase orthodoxy, they're going to affirm Jesus, fully human, fully divine. They're going to affirm the resurrection. They're going to affirm his teachings. They're going to affirm um, the sending of the Spirit. They're going to affirm the idea of God revealed his relationship, three in one, one in three, the Trinity. Uh, well, how, how can God be love if God is not God's self in relationship? And so the Trinity reveals this God as love um, in this way the persons react and relate. So I would say that um, we're already losing two right there. I must have said something heretical. I'm sorry. Um, I would say the, the differences may matter in the secondary level of doctrine and opinion. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you choose to live in some camp within Christianity if you're a follower of Jesus. You're called to be in relationship with other believers in the local church. And sometimes churches wrestle with what, what they sense is more important for them to emphasize or less important. Um, and as you mature in your faith, um, you know, I would rather that you wrestle with staying the, the orthodox things about who Jesus is, and if that means you end up having to, to move a church over the course of your lifetime, uh, that happens. Um, but ask, what do they teach about Jesus, and how do they live that out? Because he's where the power lies. He's the one in, in which we are saved and, and we are being changed, uh, and, and he's the one who, in the Father, they send the Spirit. So for me, it's always about Jesus first, and the other things are secondary or third level. Um, now, each church is going to say which things they feel are closer to that center and farther away from that center. In your church, you would absolutely have those things. Go on your website later. Look at your statements of belief. You have uh, your own statement of belief. You have a denominational statement of belief. You are using a catechism in a certain tradition. So you're saying these things, and even in that catechism, it's going to name things that are more important and other things that are vital, but you're not maybe not die on the hill stuff. You know, there's die on the hill stuff in the center, and then it kind of goes out from there. So I would rather work with a lot of Christians who are committed to the Lordship, the historicity, the resurrection of Jesus, his coming again, all of that. Um, I can walk a long way down the road with people that are in that area, but there's a lot of other stuff where it's like, we can agree to disagree and love on that. Um, and you can just be wrong, you know. No, I'm just kidding, no, 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 no. That's when we get into trouble as Christians, right? Like right there, right there, when we, when we say that and when we mean it and treat people that way. Um, that's a good one. 
Okay, um, I'm gonna jump ahead here. Are we doing okay? Okay, if you have any more questions, like I'm, I'm kind of just jumping through here because I don't, uh, again, these are all. Uh, what's the biblical perspective of the timeline of the dinosaurs? <laughs> uh, Mr. Pong, would you care to answer that question? <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> if you're up here with me next time, you don't get to dodge like that. Um, okay, so that's a Genesis creation question. I'm going to reframe the question. I'm assuming this question is related to what do you believe about creation? Well, I'm going to throw it back and say Bible-believing Christians have debated this one forever. Uh, there is uh, the, the literal seven-day view. God created in little seven days, as we would understand a day, more or less. We, we know time change over time of creation. There is the day-age view, that the days in Genesis are speaking about eons of time or epochs of time. Um, there's another view that talks about um, theistic evolution. In some churches, you may get uh, taken out back for saying that, but there is some Christians that believe that, um, that God superintended the process of evolution, which is different than a secular uh, view of that. Um, there are others who say, well, actually, that question is a modern question of the last 200 years. We're forcing on the text that the text isn't even answering that question. This is the literary framework view that says Genesis 1 and 2, in fact, are answering ancient questions that have nothing to do with our modern imposition, like we're asking late uh, science questions of the text, and the text is actually saying the main things, it's less concerned about the mechanics of how, and it's answering the questions of why and who. For example, when compared to the Epic of Gilgamesh, other ancient Near Eastern creation stories, the story where there's a, there's a battle between the gods and one of the gods is ripped, oh, sorry, I don't mean to make this like all of a sudden an R-rated violent thing here, uh, but one of the gods is like destroyed uh, violently and out of that is birthed humans and earth and all of this. Um, in the Genesis narrative, the God, of, God uh, uh, revealed as the one true God in ancient Israel says basically that God creates with the word versus through some violent act of ancient chaos. God creates with the word, and the earth is formed. Uh, God doesn't do it out of some great struggle, but simply by speaking, the world is spun into being. Um, and God said, let there be light, and poof, there was light. Um, so that the creation is seen in a very different way of a God bringing order out of chaos, not uh, pr pr producing chaos out of chaos, as it were. Um, so. Can I answer this question? No, I can't answer this question. I personally lean towards the literary framework view and let the debate rip on whether it's seven literal days or epochs of time or theistic evolution, because I think when we do that, we're actually doing violence to the text because the text is answering a much more important question. That we can figure out and wrestle with with science and human discovery for the next however long we're here till the new heavens and new earth come. Um, but I'm more concerned about the who and the how. And not only that, this God is there, but this God engages specifically with creatures that he has created, you and me, you know, in his image, he has created us. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's, I think there's other things the text is communicating that are inerrant, infallible, et cetera, and that is not one of them. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? A couple, little more? One or two more? These are great. Um, oh, ho, 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 I can't even do that one, man. Oh. And this is like, like this is without doing anonymous questions. Normally with anonymous ones, we get more relationship questions and talk about this and that. Um, so maybe next time we'll have some of that so you, you feel safer to ask some of those. But why does God still create people he knows will go to hell? Whew. Well, this, prob this question is challenging because Christians don't agree on this question, just like the creation one we talked about. Um, within different the theological frameworks, um, you will answer this question differently. I think the fundamental thing is that in, in a, like a hyper-Calvinist view where, where we'd say God is in control of all things and meticulous control, there, there would be this differentiation between God's um, intentional will, and I forget the exact language that would be used in this category, but sort of the unintended, the will that he sees but he did not desire. Um, is there single predestination or is there double predestination? Because it's totally different if we say God predestines those that are saved. Um, double predestination teaches very specifically also predestines those who go to hell. Um, so we would have to answer the question then in terms of evil, the problem of evil, and say somehow in the great mechanics of the universe, in the, in the understanding of God that there was a somehow that in the balance of good and evil and all of this, that this, uh, in God's sovereignty and the mysterious will, we can locate that there is some goodness that results from this, that even though we can't understand that. That would be one way of approaching that. 
another way of approaching it is a more of a free will defense, and, and I think that defense would be more of God risks creating creatures who could love, and love requires risks because it's not real love if you can't say no, and if you say no to the love, and then you create what is against love, anti-love, or hellish consequences. So that's also a thing there as well. So um, in both cases, I think most Orthodox Christians would want to maintain that God's intention is not to simply create creatures that will burn. Like, that is not the intention. That is, um, yeah, either an effect of a larger thing that he risks because of love or a larger thing that he does because of we can't understand the mysterious dynamics in all of it. Um, there are more shades to both of those views. I'm really oversimplifying that. The other thing is there are certain Christians that believe that God will reconcile all things. Some people believe, you also have to ask the question about the nature of hell. Is hell eternal conscious torment? I think, I'm not sure what your church teaching is on that, so I'm going to just bracket that and say, I don't know what your church teaching is on that. Check with Mr. Pong later. <laughs> um, but how do you define hell? What's the nature of hell? Some of the early church fathers taught that hell is the same flame of God's love that a Christian or, or, a, or a person who's saved would experience as um, love, another person experiences eternal conscious torment, like same thing, but experienced differently depending on how your heart has been set. Um, so wrestling with the theology of hell, that's a huge, huge thing. Christians disagree on the nature of hell, what hell is. All Orthodox Christians do believe in a final judgment. We say it in the Nicene Creed, for example, we believe he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end, right? So there's a final judgment, there's a final assize, a final weighing of how people responded to God's grace ultimate justice for those things in our world which seem like people getting away with impunity, with no consequences, um, that God will judge in the end. So, um, yeah, that's a very complex question, uh, and it can be answered in a number of ways. I think what we want to maintain, though, is the goodness of God and the primacy of God revealed, God's love and holiness woven together, God's love and justice woven together, in however we approach that question. Okay, um, one's asleep here. Anybody else asleep? We got others going to sleep. Okay, all right. Um, so we need to wrestle with that. Let me say one other thing about the hell debates. There's some great books by Zondervan, by the way, a, an evangelical publisher that has like forward views of hell. And we're talking about people that have a high view of the Bible, by the way. I'm not talking about like universalists or people that are outside of traditional Christian orthodoxy. But there's some good books on there that actually will do this, will weigh these things. Um, and your church will teach probably a certain tradition on this that matters. Like why did your church land on where it lands? And there's probably some great teaching that's available here on that, where where faith uh, Baptist is on these things. So uh, know why your church is there. The NAB Statement of Faith teaches about the idea of an eternal hell, a conscious torment as well. Um, so yeah, good question. Sorry I rambled on that because there's, there's not like one answer to that question. There's depends on which way you wrestle with Scripture. Okay, let me just random pick one more here. Um, do, 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 do. Make sure. Oh, I got. See, he sent me these emails, and I was like, okay. Oh. Mm, 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 mm. oh, these are all so good. Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. Great questions, uh, uh, men and women. Great questions you got here. Here's a practical one struggling with doing daily devotions. Let's do that, okay? Let's, let's zoom into the practical. Um, Struggling with daily, doing daily devotions, any tips on how to read without making a chore? Any book recommendations for Bible commentary? Well, yes, in fact, all kinds of ideas. <laughs> First and foremost, I love the question because there's a struggle. You're, you haven't completely given up. You're struggling. Whew. Remember the story of uh, Jacob getting the new name, the, uh, Israel, with the angel, right? Wrestling with the angel who's a theophany, a, a manifestation of the Lord in, in a physical form. And, um, and Jacob wrestled with the angel until midnight. And in that story, one of the un Semitic ways of understanding that story is that what is being blessed here, that God is making God self vulnerable and that God can wrestle the angel, as it were. Um, so God is condescending to be in relationship with Jacob and, and in fact, uh, uh, puts God's self down to Jacob's level so much so that the, the, the struggling continued and finally God uh, disables him, so to speak, or does something with his hip, we're told. And at the end, he's told that because you wrestled with God, I'm going to change your name. And the, and the name is really one who wrestles with God. And as we think about encountering God, 
those devotional practices that we seek, and there's many different spiritual disciplines throughout 2,000 years of Christian history and, and within uh, the, the Judaism that goes before that is built, that we're grafted into, right? Um, my biggest challenge would be find those resources. There are apps that can give you a scripture or a passage to read, whether it's going through a book or whether it's more, you know, kind of topical or whatever. There are practices around prayer practices of the daily office of setting alarms and, and pausing three times a day and praying. There's, I mean, right now there's tons of apps that can help you with this, let alone uh, using the paper books that we have. But there's prayer books to use. There are guided reading lists to use. There's the three-year lectionary. There's the daily two-year lectionary. There's uh, Baptists. We create our own stuff over and over again. You know, like it's the same. Like there's all kinds of resources. I would say find something that you can you can stick with. And with anything, creating a habit, you've got to kind of force yourself into it you know, for two to three months, and then, then it becomes where you miss it when you don't do it anymore. Um, and so I think that's part of it as well. Figuring out the things that work for you. Um, and if you need to, work with others. Sometimes there's a reading we're going to read together. We're going to reflect together in our small group or in a, in a, in a, some sort of covenanted group that you're going to work through something. Other. So there's any, there's thousands of resources out there. The key is don't give up. Like, find the ones that resonate with you. And it will change over the course. If you're a Christian from now until the end of your life, wherever, whenever that may be, uh, what you find feeding your soul and your wrestling with God will shift over time. Um, and so just being open to trying those new things. And don't be too freaked out. Like, push yourself a little bit. Um, and, yeah, there's lots of things out there to do that. But I love that question. Keep wrestling. It indicates that there's something within you that's yearning for more. Um, but in our distracted culture, the biggest problem I think is distraction. Like our phones are horrible, you know, like they're just, they're, they're life sucking. And there's new research too that even backs this up, right? Like in classrooms are moving back towards getting rid of computers and getting rid of other because of retention on paper versus on screen is totally different. Our minds think something else is going on when we're reading a piece of paper versus reading a phone. Um, so I would say also find tools, maybe using the paper Bible, maybe finding prayer books that can help you with that. Um, well, I'm going to end it, I think. We've gone a long time. Uh, can I ask one more question just straight from the floor, if anyone has one? Like, there's a few more questions in here. I didn't get to all of them, but man, all of them, as I'm skimming really fast, are really good. Anybody have a question they want to get in there that maybe you're dying to say, ask? They all intimidated by one another. Don't worry. We will not chop off the head that sticks out. Don't worry. Way to go. All right. Kudos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Great question couple different answers. If you go on to Appalachia, I think there's some Baptist churches and Pentecostals that do snake handling. So if you want to see that live, you can. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, so they do take that verse quite literally and do that. Uh, they would be very much out of the mainstream. <laughs> so, but if you want to pick up some rattlesnakes, uh, yeah, take a, take a nice tour down into the deep south of the U.S. and you could probably find a church or two that's doing that. Um, Everyone's going to YouTube or Google that later. <laughs> Snake handling churches in Appalachia. Okay, there's your there's your homework. No, I'm no no no. I'm just kidding. No no. Uh, I think it's a great question. So different people answer that differently. That the era of, for example, churches that would say that fewer of the spiritual gifts are in operation today than in the first era, than the apostolic or the the initial apostolic era of the church would say that those things were for the initial demonstration of the authority of God uh, before the canon gets closed. Where or, you know or not. Well, at least before the Bible becomes what we have it now is all written. So some would say that that doesn't know more because it's not. It was for that early time frame. That's one answer to that. Others would say, well, no, all those gifts are still in operation. Now, you're not supposed to pick up serpents. The idea is like that sometimes there's supernatural protection, and you may not even be aware of it till after the fact, right? Um, and that, those stories continue to this day. Now, the stories of the persecuted church and, you know, the guards missing the Bibles, like those kinds of things, like those stories, we still have stories like that that are generated. Uh, and, and so not reading those as like literal snakes, but rather those things seeking to destroy and kill the message of supernatural protection of the church, like there's stories of that and other stories where 
people became martyrs as well. And that has continued throughout. And so, and the advancement of the message of the kingdom, how I hear that text is saying that there's something of the Spirit's power that will be at work as we risk for the kingdom in the places of the margins. Um, I mean, I love the fact you guys are praying for home churches in mainland China. That's a, quite a spiritual and political statement. I'm going to be on the island. If I wasn't, I'm visiting it or serving in another church on that weekend, I would be here joining you because I, I pray for the persecuted church around the world. Um, but that kind of verse comes to mind. You know, well, why didn't the cameras that Hick Vision installed in the church in mainland, uh, somehow they, you know, on a crucial Sunday, somehow they didn't work? Well, maybe that was the Holy Spirit, you know, or it was bad tech. Either way, uh, you know, um, so I, so I think I would understand in terms of the mission of the church and the protection of the Holy Spirit as we take risks for the kingdom. And this gets back to that first question about sharing Jesus. When you risk, I mean, don't be rude. Like, you know, nobody wants to be beat over the head with the Bible, Christian or not. Um, but being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, but when the Holy Spirit is pushing, hey, you know, talk to that friend. Walk up to them and say, hey, you know what? I, maybe the Lord will give you a, 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 something to say to them. Maybe a verse, maybe a, hey, I just, I know it's going to sound crazy, but I just felt like a nudge uh, to, to ask you about this or that or the other thing, whatever it might be. Like, that could be a Holy Spirit thing. And also the idea of risking for the kingdom and that God is most present in that. And the Great Commission says the same thing. You know, he talks about go therefore, make disciples of all nations, and that lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. There's a promise of his power from below to go with us when we risk for Jesus. Some of the best ways, by the way, to strengthen your faith is to get on the edges uh, and, and do something for Jesus that puts you out of your comfort zone, because that's where we often experience the power of the Spirit. Um, now, I'm not saying don't go literally go pick up a snake or a scorpion, but rather that risk, uh, and sometimes our risk unbeknownst to us. And I think the early church also probably would have read that more allegorically than we would. We would read it overly literally because of our late modern ways of thinking. Um, but I think they would have read it much more allegorically in terms of forces and powers, principalities, and people that have aligned themselves against the gospel than they would, like, go down to Appalachia and literally get in a, in a tank of snakes, you know. No, I don't think that's actually what that passage is. I don't know if that helps or not, but that's a great question. Okay, well, I should be done because it's a lot. Can you stand? Can we pray? I know we got more going on here, but um, thank you so much for being flexible on this. Um, I really do, and, um, you know, if we can do it again sometime, I would love to, um, and I know it's not for everyone, but in our past churches, we've done it, and I'd have a guest with me or an in-house person, and uh, we would use them as invitational Sundays, too. A lot of non-Christians, you know, or not a lot, but people would invite non-Christian or, or people that maybe are leaving the faith or wrestling with leaving the faith to make it a safe way to ask anonymous questions. Um, and sometimes they become really spicy questions too. Uh, so, which is fine because we're humans, we're in body, we're living life. And, and I may not have the answer. Uh, I may not know how to re rightly find the answer in the text. You know, people, this is a book with unending riches. But making space for that is really important in your church communities. And it may not always be on a Sunday gathering also, but small groups and other discipleship venues. Don't be afraid to wrestle with the questions. God can handle it, right? I mean, holy cow, he can handle creating all of us. He can handle the questions. Um, and in fact, the story of Jacob and the angel tells us that is one way we sustain a lifelong faith is through wrestling with questions, with God, with others, with the scriptures, with our community. The Spirit can speak to us in that time. So, so Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. I want to pray for them first, okay. Uh, Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters today. Uh, thank you for this opportunity from Mr. Pong and uh, the leadership here to just uh, every now and again uh, serve this English congregation. Lord, I'm so excited about what you're doing in these lives. And God, that the story that you are weaving together for each person here um, is greater than, than they can see even at this stage in their journey. So Holy Spirit, please watch over them. Draw them close to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you.
All righty. Thank you, Pastor Bays, for the question response period. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope to have it again. Um, for our song response, I'd like to sing um, Knowing You, Jesus. Please remain standing as we sing this song. verse comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided to, in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Offering is the right and responsibility of Christians if you're not yet a believer uh, or do not understand the meaning of offering. Please help us by passing the offering bag along. I now invite the ushers up um, as we sing our last song, Cornerstone. <laughs> Yes. 
now bow our heads as we pray for our offering. Lord God Almighty, thank you for all you've provided for us. Thank you for the opportunity to give, whether it's our time, actions, or monetary offerings. Lord, I pray that you use them according to your will so that it may further your ministry. Um, please take it to where it's needed and um, yeah, help it further your truth. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing doxology. Praise God. for benediction. I'm going to share again, I think I might have done this before, just a closing from 1 Thessalonians 5. Beautiful as Paul is concluding this letter. He says, Now may the God of peace himself make you completely holy and may your spirit and soul and body be kept entirely blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is trustworthy and he will in fact do this. Love that. Brothers and sisters, pray for us too. Greet everyone with a holy kiss. And uh, again, he goes on and says, I call on you solemnly in the Lord to have this letter read all. And he ends with this. We can uh, translate holy kiss into modern handshake or side hug. But um, now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen and amen. conclude our uh, worship service with a silent prayer. Okay, folks. Uh, yeah, welcome to join our Sunday service. Okay, yeah, may our Lord lead you and guide you in this coming week. Okay, God bless. <laughs>